Welcome back to another video. These are the references that I've used to create this video. Let's begin. Systemic sclerosis is a rare chronic disorder characterized by diffuse fibrosis of skin and internal organs. Symptoms usually appear in the third to fifth decade, and women are affected two to three times as frequently as men. The word scleroderma literally means thickening of skin, since thickened and indurated skin is the distinguishing hallmark of this disease. We can broadly classify scleroderma as scleroderma having manifestations limited to skin or scleroderma involving other systems of the body, which is known as systemic sclerosis. Systemic sclerosis can be segregated into two major subsets. That is diffuse cutaneous systemic sclerosis and limited cutaneous systemic sclerosis. The pathogenesis of systemic sclerosis involves three cardinal pathomechanistic processes, namely microangiopathy, inflammation and autoimmunity, and fibrosis. Microangiopathy basically refers to the endothelial damage, which disrupts vasodilatory and vasoconstricting substances and leads to increased permeability of microvessels, activation of the coagulation cascades, elevated thrombin production, and impaired fibrinolysis. This in turn causes the thickening of the basement membrane and perivascular adventitial fibrosis, which ultimately leads to impaired blood flow and tissue ischemia. Prominent microangiopathy in multiple vascular beds is a hallmark of systemic sclerosis with important clinical sequelae including mucocutaneous telangiectasias, Raynaud's phenomenon, ischemic digital ulcers, scleroderma renal crisis, myocardial involvement, and pulmonary arterial hypertension. A number of observations support the inflammatory or autoimmune nature of systemic sclerosis, which include presence of circulating autoantibodies, clustering of systemic sclerosis with other autoimmune diseases, and the presence of activated immune cells, including autoreactive T-cells. Fibrosis in systemic sclerosis is caused by a replacement of normal tissue architecture with rigid, avascular, and relatively acellular connective tissue. Let's take a closer look at the two major subsets of systemic sclerosis. Skin involvement in the limited cutaneous type has a more indolent onset, is limited to the face and fingers, and remains distal to the elbows, whereas the diffuse cutaneous version has a rapid onset and involves fingers, face, extremities, and the trunk. Crest syndrome in the limited cutaneous type involves calcinosis, Raynaud's phenomenon, esophageal dysmotility, telangiectasias, and sclerodictyly, whereas in the diffuse cutaneous type, there is crest syndrome along with systemic involvement. Mild arthralgias are usually seen in the limited cutaneous version, whereas the diffuse cutaneous type involves severe arthralgias, carpal tunnel syndrome, and tendon friction rubs. Calcinosis cutis is frequent and prominent in the limited cutaneous type, whereas it is less common and mild in the diffuse type. Pulmonary arterial hypertension is a frequent and late manifestation in the limited cutaneous type, whereas in the diffuse cutaneous type, it occurs in association with interstitial lung disease. Scleroderma renal crisis is rare in the limited type, but occurs early, that is, less than four years from disease onset, in the diffuse type. Interstitial lung disease is generally mild and slowly progressive in the limited type, whereas it is frequent, severe, and has an early onset in the diffuse type. The autoantibodies commonly seen in the limited cutaneous type are anti-centromere antibodies, while anti-topoisomerase 1 and anti-RNA polymerase 3 are seen in the diffuse cutaneous type. In some patients, Raynaud's phenomenon and characteristic lab features occur in the absence of detectable skin thickening. This is a relatively benign subset of systemic sclerosis and is termed as systemic sclerosis sign scleroderma. For diagnosing systemic sclerosis, a diagnostic criteria has been proposed by the American College of Rheumatology, according to which, if a patient presents with skin thickening, which is bilateral and extends proximal to the metacarpal phalangeal joints, the patient will be given a score of 9. Skin thickening of the fingers only is subdivided into either having puffy fingers or having sclerodictyly, distal to the metacarpophalangeal joints. Puffy fingers will be given a score of 2 and sclerodictyly will be given a score of 4. 
For fingertip lesions, they can either be digital tip ulcers or fingertip pitting scars. Digital tip ulcers will be given a score of 2, whereas fingertip pitting scars will be given a score of 3. Mucocutaneous telangiectasias will be given a score of 2. Abnormal nail fold capillary pattern will also be given a score of 2. Lung involvement could either be in the form of pulmonary arterial hypertension or interstitial lung disease. Pulmonary arterial hypertension will be given a score of 2 and interstitial lung disease will also be given a score of 2. Raynaud's phenomenon will be given a score of 3 and systemic sclerosis specific autoantibodies which involve anti-centromere antibodies, anti-topoisomerase 1 antibodies and anti-RNA polymerase 3 antibodies will be given a score of 3. Patients with a total score of 9 or more are classified as having definite systemic sclerosis. Let's take a look at the initial clinical presentation of both the subsets of systemic sclerosis, that is diffuse cutaneous systemic sclerosis and limited cutaneous systemic sclerosis. In the diffuse cutaneous form, the interval between Raynaud's phenomenon and onset of other disease manifestations is brief, that is weeks to months. There is an inflammatory edematous phase, which involves soft tissue swelling, puffy fingers, and pruritus. The inflammatory edematous phase evolves into a fibrotic phase, with skin induration associated with hair loss, a decline in sweating capacity, and progressive flexion contractures of the fingers. The course of limited cutaneous systemic sclerosis tends to be more indolent. The interval between onset of Raynaud's phenomenon and other disease manifestations is as long as years. Scleroderma renal crisis, significant interstitial lung disease, and tendon friction rubs occur rarely. Patients with established systemic sclerosis show a characteristic mouse head appearance, with a taut and shiny skin, loss of wrinkles, and occasionally an expressionless face due to reduced mobility of eyelids, cheeks, and mouth. Patients have a reduced oral aperture, which interferes with eating and oral hygiene, and a pinched beak-like nose. Transverse creases on the dorsum of fingers disappear. Bilateral symmetrical skin thickening is the hallmark of systemic sclerosis. Breakdown of atrophic skin leads to chronic ulceration. Dilated skin capillaries, usually 2 to 20 mm in diameter, are referred to as telangiectasias and are frequently found on lips, hands, face, and oral mucosa. The number of telangiectasias correlates with the severity of microvascular disease, including pulmonary arterial hypertension. Dystrophic calcifications in the skin, subcutaneous, and soft tissue are referred to as calcinosis cutis, and they occur in the presence of normal serum calcium and phosphate levels. Differentiating primary Raynaud's disease from secondary Raynaud's phenomenon can present a diagnostic challenge. Primary Raynaud's disease is supported by absence of an underlying cause, family history of Raynaud's phenomenon, absence of digital tissue necrosis or ulceration, and a negative ANA test. Secondary Raynaud's phenomenon occurs at an older age, is more severe, episodes are more frequent, prolonged, and painful, it is frequently complicated by ischemic digital ulcers and loss of digits. The two principal forms of lung involvement in systemic sclerosis include interstitial lung disease and pulmonary vascular disease or pulmonary arterial hypertension. Pulmonary arterial hypertension is often asymptomatic in early stages and patients present with exertional dyspnea and reduced exercise capacity. With disease progression, signs and symptoms of right-sided heart failure appear. Physical examination may show tachypnea, loud pulmonic component of S2 heart sound, pulmonic or tricuspid regurgitation murmur, palpable right ventricular heave, elevated jugular venous pressure, and dependent edema. Interstitial lung disease presents with exertional dyspnea, fatigue, and chronic dry cough. Physical examination may reveal fine inspiratory velcro crackles at the lung bases. Characteristic imaging findings include lower lobe subpleural reticular linear opacities and ground glass opacifications. In systemic sclerosis, there is variable involvement of the GI tract. Principal manifestations in the oropharynx include diminished oral aperture, dry mouth, periodontitis and gingivitis owing to poor dental hygiene since the oral aperture is reduced, and of course dysphagia.
Most systemic sclerosis patients show symptoms of gastroesophageal reflux that is heartburn, regurgitation, and dysphagia. Esophageal strictures and Barrett's esophagus may complicate chronic gastroesophageal reflux disease in systemic sclerosis patients. Gastroparesis with early satiety, abdominal distension, and aggravated reflux symptoms is common. Gastric antral vascular ectasia may occur in the antrum. These are sub-epithelial lesions reflecting the widespread small vessel vasculopathy of systemic sclerosis and are called watermelon stomach due to their endoscopic appearance. Principal manifestations in the small and large intestines include chronic diarrhea due to small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and pseudo-obstruction due to disturbed intestinal motor function. An unusual radiologic finding is pneumatosis intestinalis, which is due to air trapping in the bowel wall that may rarely rupture and cause benign pneumoperitoneum. Fat and protein malabsorption, as well as vitamin D and B12 deficiencies, ensue and may be further exacerbated by pancreatic insufficiency. Colonic pseudodiverticula may occur in late stages of systemic sclerosis and cause perforation and bleeding. The principal manifestation in the anorectum includes sphincter incompetence, fecal incontinence, and rectal prolapse. Scleroderma renal crisis presents with accelerated hypertension accompanied by acute kidney injury and progressive failure. The pathogenesis involves obliterative vasculopathy of the renal arcuate and interlobular arteries with consequent intravascular hemolysis, which leads to progressive reduction in renal blood flow, which is further aggravated by vasospasm and leads to increased renin secretion and angiotensin II production. This further leads to renal vasoconstriction and a vicious cycle culminating in accelerated hypertension ensues. Urine analysis shows mild proteinuria, granular casts, and microscopic hematuria. High-risk patients should monitor their BP daily, Glucocorticoid use is associated with scleroderma renal crisis. Therefore, prednisone and high-risk patients should only be taken at low doses when absolutely required. Pericardial involvement is manifested as pericarditis, pericardial effusions, constrictive pericarditis, and rarely cardiac tamponade. Conduction system fibrosis is common and may be silent or manifested by heart block. Other arrhythmias include premature ventricular contractions, atrial fibrillation, and supraventricular tachycardia. Systolic or diastolic left ventricular dysfunction may progress to overt heart failure. Musculoskeletal complications include carpal tunnel syndrome, generalized arthralgias and stiffness in early disease, fixed contractures at proximal interphalangeal joints, and bone resorption in terminal phalanges leading to loss of distal tufts, which is known as acroosteolysis. Early in its course, systemic sclerosis can cause diagnostic confusion with other autoimmune diseases. Differentials of systemic sclerosis include eosinophilic fasciitis, which presents with skin hardening that resembles diffuse systemic sclerosis. This can be distinguished from systemic sclerosis by the presence of peripheral blood eosinophilia, absence of Raynaud's phenomenon, and good response to prednisone. Scleromyxedema also involves diffuse skin thickening and visceral involvement, and it can be distinguished from systemic sclerosis by presence of a paraprotein, absence of Raynaud's phenomenon, and distinct skin histology. Diabetic chiroarthropathy or diabetic hand syndrome can mimic sclerodactyly. Diabetic chiroarthropathy is basically a complication of long-standing uncontrolled diabetes, characterized by limited movement of the joints of hands and thickening of the skin on palmar and dorsal surfaces. The choice of therapy in systemic sclerosis patients is often driven by other disease manifestations. For example, in patients with arthritis, methotrexate is preferred, while in those with interstitial lung disease, mycophenolate mofetil is preferred. Methotrexate is titrated up to 15 or 20 mg orally once weekly, and mycophenolate mofetil is titrated up to 2,000 or 3,000 mg orally daily. Telangiectasias present as a cosmetic problem and can be treated with pulsed dye laser. Occlusive dressings are advised for ischemic digital ulcers.
Scleroderma renal crisis is a medical emergency and is treated with ACE inhibitors, for example, captopril, initiated at 25 mg orally every 6 hours and titrated up as tolerated to a maximum of 100 mg every 6 hours. High-risk patients, that is, patients with early disease, extensive and progressive skin involvement, tendon friction rubs and anti-RNA polymerase 3 antibodies should monitor their blood pressure daily. It is advised to use glucocorticoids only when absolutely necessary and to avoid potentially nephrotoxic drugs. Up to two-thirds systemic sclerosis patients necessitate dialysis. For patients with gastrointestinal manifestations, regular dental care is recommended to avoid periodontal disease. Patients are advised to elevate head end of the bed, eat frequent small meals, avoid alcohol and known reflux exacerbants, and late-night meals to reduce esophageal reflux. Proton pump inhibitors such as omeprazole, 20 to 40 mg per day orally, are recommended. Oral prokinetic agents such as metoclopramide, 10 mg 4 times daily or cisapride 10 to 20 mg 4 times daily can improve dysphagia caused by esophageal hypomotility. Malabsorption due to bacterial overgrowth responds to antibiotics, for example, rifaximin, 550 mg given 3 times orally daily. Episodic bleeding from watermelon stomach or gastric antral vascular ectasias is treated with endoscopic ablation. For patients who require treatment for interstitial lung disease, mycophenolate mofetil 1000 to 1500 mg orally twice daily can improve dyspnea and pulmonary function tests modestly. The interleukin-6 inhibitor, tocilizumab, 162 mg subcutaneously once weekly, slows the rate of decline in pulmonary function tests and is used as an alternative in patients not tolerating mycophenolate mofetil. Nintadanib, which is an inhibitor of multiple tyrosine kinases, slows the progression of systemic sclerosis-associated lung disease. Therapies for pulmonary arterial hypertension include phosphodiesterase type 5 inhibitors, including sildenafil, tadalafil, and vardenafil. Endothelin-1 receptor antagonists such as bosentin and mesitentin are used. Endothelin-A receptor antagonists such as ambricentin can be used. For refractory pulmonary hypertension, prostacyclin pathway agonists such as iloprost, triprostanil, and epoprostanol may be required.